Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar on contraceptive method choice, challenges, opportunities, and trends. We have a great group of speakers who have come together today to discuss this important topic and I know we have plenty to discuss, so let's go ahead and begin. My name is Marissa Pine Yakey, and I am with Population Reference Bureau and the PACE Project, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. Joining me, I have speakers with expertise in family planning method choice. Like our audience, they are joining us from around the world, so please bear with us if we run into any logistical challenges during the webinar. Kate Bay Easton is the Director for Country Coordinators of the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning, which she co-founded in 2013. Kate is also currently Program Officer for the Challenge Initiative at the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health, and she's a medical doctor. She'll be speaking today about the barriers and challenges to achieving contraceptive method choice. Martin Smith is the Managing Director of Family Planning 2020. He oversees the Data and Performance Management and Country Support Portfolios of the FP2020 Secretariat. Before FP2020, Martin was a Country Director for Marie Stopes International in Sierra Leone and India. In all of these roles, Martin has worked to increase access to family planning, and we'll be talking about some of the opportunities today to continue expanding method choice. And Jessica Williamson is a data analyst with Avenir Health. As part of Avenir Health's Monitoring and Evaluation and Advocacy Center, Jessica provides analysis and management of family planning data for Track 20. Prior to this role, she worked as part of the Impact Analysis Team at Marie Stokes International, supporting the use of routine data for decision making. And Jessica will be speaking about how contraceptive method choice is measured through surveys and what the data tell us. We'll hear from each of our speakers today and then allow time for the panelists to respond to questions from the audience. You may submit questions at any time during the webinar using the questions box in your GoToMeeting control panel. We have a large group who's joined us today, so apologies in advance if we are not able to respond to every question. So to begin, we need to understand what we mean by method choice. Contraceptive method choice means that family planning programs through facilities or community-based distributors have a variety of contraceptive methods available and fully counsel users about their choices. With full information and a range of choices, users can identify a method that is available, acceptable, and meets her or his needs. According to USAID, as you see here, method choice exists when client-centered information, counseling, and services enable women, youth, men, and couples to decide and freely choose a contraceptive method that best meets their reproductive desires and lifestyle while balancing other considerations important to method adoption, use, and change. And when we talk about contraceptive method choice, we often talk about a full range of contraceptive methods. But what does a full range really include? Most programs consider full range to mean offering at least one method from each category that you see here. So barrier methods, such as condoms, short-acting methods, such as pills and injectables, long-acting reversible methods, such as IUDs and implants, permanent sterilization, and emergency contraception. In addition, programs should offer resources and counseling for natural family planning methods. Expanding method choice and giving users access to a full range of contraceptive methods is important for several reasons. First, it can increase the use and continuation of family planning. Around the world, we know that there are 214 million women and couples who would like to plan or space their next pregnancy by two years or more, but are not using a method of contraception. Expanding the range of contraceptive choices available so that users can identify a method that is available, accessible, and meets her or his needs can help. 
evidence shows that each new contraceptive method that is realistically available for more than half of the population can lead to measurable increases in the contraceptive prevalence rate. In addition, the right to the highest attainable standard of health, as defined by WHO and others, entitles people to healthcare information, services, and commodities that are available, accessible, acceptable, and of good quality. Ensuring access to a full range of methods is a defining characteristic of quality of care and therefore human rights in sexual and reproductive health programs. So by promoting method choice, programs not only meet the needs of their clients, but enhance their efforts to uphold rights and quality of care. With that understanding, I'm happy to introduce Kate Bay Easton, who will talk about some of the barriers and challenges in achieving method choice today. Thank you, Marisa. Hi, everyone. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us in this webinar to talk about expanding method choice. As I thought about this presentation, it occurred to me that emphasizing the importance of method choice would be preaching to the choir, because my hope is that everybody attending the webinar will immediately agree that method choice is important. But if that were the case, we would not be here today. If that were the case, everyone, including adolescents and youth, will have access to a wide range of affordable contraceptive methods but you will agree with me that that's not the reality we face today. Why expand method choice? Method-specific contraceptive prevalence varies widely, and there are wide differences in contraceptive prevalence across cities, countries, and regions. We must respect autonomy, integrity, choice, and diversity. Method choice is not a privilege. Ensuring the decision of if you would like to use a method, what you would like to use, where and how to use contraception is essential to ensuring reproductive rights. Contraceptives should empower everyone, men, boys, women and girls, to enjoy their sexuality, to negotiate and reduce vulnerabilities they are exposed to. It is very important here to think about different populations and their needs. Slide, please. Not only do different women have different needs and might choose different contraceptives if given the opportunity. In a lifetime, one woman or girl's needs for contraceptives would change over time. At different periods of her life, she would need a different method. For example, a couple wanting to delay first pregnancy might choose a contraceptive method for that particular period in their lives. But when they have a first child and want to space births, they might choose a different method. If that same couple believe they have completed their childbearing, they would choose a totally different method. An unmarried sexually active girl might want to prevent pregnancy while in school and choose one method. But while she's married and wants to delay first pregnancy, she might prefer a totally different method. This diversity emphasizes the importance of expanded method choice. In that same light, different populations face varied and sometimes unique barriers and challenges in accessing a full range of contraceptive methods. Unmarried youth, married women or couples reaching to delay their first pregnancy or limit the number of births, people with disabilities, women who recently gave birth, post-abortion care clients, or women living with HIV. When we look at challenges and barriers linked to supply and services, we have stockouts. Stockouts affect all age groups, but they particularly affect youth because they are more likely than older clients to use shock acting methods that require frequent supply. For services, there are inadequate number of skilled providers or providers who lack the qualifications and equipment training or at times just the confidence to offer certain methods, such as long-acting reversible contraceptives. As you will see in upcoming slides, this is about contraceptive availability, but not just availability, think accessibility. A closer look at provider bias and prejudice. This affects different groups of people. For young people, after talking to multiple young people, it's clear that one of the barriers to expanding access to long-acting methods are providers, 
who are reluctant to counsel on or provide some methods to young people, especially those who are unmarried. And this is backed by research. Some providers disapprove of marital sexual activity altogether, and they refuse to provide services to unmarried young clients. Other providers mistakenly believe that certain methods may threaten future fertility or the health of their clients. Some may only approve of condoms or other methods for clients who are young or have never given birth. For women who have recently given birth, they are the beginning of a critical window to prevent closely spaced pregnancies. However, they may be overlooked by providers who focus on the fact that breastfeeding or postpartum abstinence will protect them from pregnancy. The postpartum period could be a missed opportunity if family planning services are not integrated into all maternal and child health care services. Post-abortion clients have a universal need for family planning, but due to abortion-related stigma and the separation of abortion care services from family planning services, many women may leave facilities without a contraceptive method. Poor or insufficient counseling may just be the main roadblock to overcoming cultural barriers or myths and misconceptions. Looking at some of these myths and misconceptions, we have heard them all. Some women or girls think that contraceptives would make them infertile or make them sick. Yesterday, I just heard that in a community in Burkina Faso, a, um, I think in French it's marabou, <laughs> Uh, it's like a traditional leader or something, said that when you die with an implant inserted, you would directly go to hell. And this caused many women and girls who had implants to go take them out. We all consider these myths, but to those who are not informed, these are all facts. Out-of-pocket user fees typically vary by method. So besides the cost, even though the cost per couple year of protection for an IUD is less than that for an injectable, the out-of-pocket costs for an injectable user may be perceived to be less, given that the upfront cost for one visit for the injectable is less than that for an IUD. We know that logs are the most effective method and they avert most pregnancies and they are less likely to be infallible, but the upfront costs tend to be higher Consider that after providing comprehensive counseling to a couple on the different contraceptive methods and they choose a contraceptive method and you, you might not have the method and you refer them to the only clinic in the city which offers that method, an IUD for example, it is disheartening to find out that even if they could make it to the clinic, they would not be able to afford the IUD. This can pose a barrier to choice for young people who often have more limited financial resources than older clients do. I wanted to talk about confidentiality, which is a unique consideration for young people. A friend once told me that if I go to a health center for contraceptive services, in less than a couple of days, my friends or family would know about it. And this alone prevents me from asking questions about the range of contraceptive services available to me. The policy environment also has a huge part to play. Policy restrictions include the laws limiting contraceptive availability or restricting access. Some laws require consent from a spouse or parent, and this in itself infringes on the user's rights to a full method choice. Some partners have different fertility intentions or preferences. Adolescents, for example, do not want to discuss sex or contraception with their parents, and vice versa. I don't think the parents want to discuss it, at this point anyway. Users choosing long-acting reversible or permanent methods, which are generally more effective, may face barriers such as eligibility requirements by age or number of prior births. And expanding method choice to these people means eliminating restrictive policies, being supportive, being client-centered and ensuring the availability of methods that can best meet their needs and preferences. Thinking about hormonal factors, um, a, a study I carried out using PMA 2020 data, uh, which is backed by other studies, 
shows that progesterone only injectable contraceptives are the most widely used contraceptive method in the country. And recent evidence from a study carried out by Policy Al suggests that an increased risk of HIV acquisition is found among users of progesterone only injectable contraceptives. Women living with HIV do not only have to live with the stigma and the stares and the misconceptions that it cannot procreate, but at times even the choice of contraceptive methods could be quite slim for them. They need comprehensive counseling, they need to know what's available to them and what they can actually access when there are potential barriers to certain methods for their context. In conclusion, I want to quote a study, 2014 study by Bertrand and Al, which said that a family, a national family planning program could have a variety of methods physically available, but if clients are not aware of them, if they do not have accurate knowledge or cannot access them because of policy, distance, cost, or social and cultural barriers, then the program will still fall short of supporting clients' reproductive goals. Next slide, please. These are words that we should not only get comfortable with, but which we should incorporate in all of our work and programs. The right to decide reality, informed choice, voluntary, equitable access, a wide range of options, client-centered, comprehensive, variety, and of course, the contraceptive commodities. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Kate. Moving on, we'll hear next from Martin Smith of Family Planning 2020, who will talk about the opportunities to expand method choice. Thank you very much, uh, Marissa, and thanks to PRB for arranging uh, this webinar, and thanks very much to Kate uh, for her opening presentation as well. As Marissa set out, I'm going to speak about opportunities uh, for expanding method choice, and I'm going to set out that uh, we have possibly the greatest opportunity for many years within our sector to expand to the fullest possible range of methods available uh, to women and girls across the 69 countries right here and right now uh, over the next few years through to 2020. So as I go through my presentation, I'll speak first about the FP 2020 rights and empowerment principles, which underpin uh, all of the work we do as a movement. I'll secondly then touch upon FP 2020's core indicators uh, in terms of our progress on family planning that will then uh, prefigure some of the uh, some of the uh, presentation that, um, that Jessica will give uh, after me. Thirdly, I'll talk about the, uh, the FP Summit in July of 2017 and the very impressive array of commitments that were made to expanding method choice within that summit from a range of partners. And lastly then, I'll talk about some strategies for expanding, expanding method choice that we're seeing in those commitments and indeed in the operational work of FP 2020 commitment making countries and partners. So as we all know, and we've heard very clearly from Marissa and indeed from Kate, we know that method choice is absolutely critical for rights-based family planning and it's of fundamental importance to FP 2020 of course, and that's because the full range of methods necessary to respond to the needs of women and girls um, who, who sit at the, uh, at the heart of the uh, FP 2020 movement. Now, FP 2020's rights and empowerment principles set this out very clearly. And these principles underpin, as I said earlier on, the work uh, that we do and indeed underpin the way in which we want to move towards 120 million additional users of a modern method of family planning in the year 2020. And crucially within those rights and empowerment principles. We talk about availability, of course, and we talk about healthcare facilities and indeed uh, community-based distribution, trained providers and contraceptive methods are available to ensure that individuals can exercise their full choice from the full range of contraceptive methods uh, that we heard from Marissa at the beginning. And that, of course, includes crucial follow-up for long-acting methods in terms of follow-up services and removal services for implants and IUDs. And as we know, uh, successful family planning programs listen to the different needs of clients and respond with strategies that expand informed voluntary choice. Next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned, uh, FP2020 has uh, 18 core indicators. Uh, it was 17 last year, it's 18. I'll mention why in a moment. And we will publish our annual progress report as FP2020, uh, which will set out the way ahead for family planning uh, over the next few years. And we'll publish that on December the 5th at 12.01 GMT uh, in digital form. So please do uh, look for that. We will publicize it uh, greatly, of course. And Jessica will speak in a bit more detail, as I say. But when we look at these 18 core indicators, the eye, of course, is taken to uh, core indicator nine that you can see here, uh, the uh, contraceptive, modern contraceptive method mix, the percentage of women who are using each method of contraception in a particular country. And as we know, it's a complex indicator because uh, choice of method reflects individual preferences, social and cultural norms, local and regional issues that affect contraceptive availability and accessibility, including policies within that given country, the cost of those contraceptives, the infrastructure available to deliver them and provide training, uh, which we also heard from Kate on just now. And there is no right method mix, no ideal percentage breakdown that we can offer to countries as the, uh, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the golden rule. But there is a broad consensus, of course, that access to a wide variety of methods is critical uh, in terms of the quality of care agenda and, of course, in terms of rights -based, the rights-based framework that we operate under. And so I say uh, that the contraceptive method mix core indicator nine is useful in and of itself but also useful in conjunction with other key indicators. For example, uh, core indicator number 11 here, the, uh, the number of service delivery points offering at least three methods in the case of primary facilities, five methods in secondary and tertiary facilities, very important to look at in conjunction with core indicator nine, and indeed core indicator 10 here to understand the current position with regard to stockouts of particular methods is absolutely crucial uh, when we need to understand method choice uh, in a given country context. And just a short word here on the new core indicator 18, which has been added in our annual progress report of 2017, which looks at total discontinuation rate for each method, which again is a, an important uh, addition to our, uh, our ability to, uh, to track uh, overall method use and whether method choice is, is being realized. The next slide, please. So this uh, wonderful uh, montage of photographs uh, all date from uh, for an auspicious day on July the 11th of 2017, when policymakers, donors, and advocates from around the world gathered in London. And indeed, there were 34 satellite events in FP 2020 commitment-making countries around the globe. There are currently 41 FP 2020 country commitment makers I'm sure, as you all know, and those those um, those meetings in London at the summit and indeed around the world discussed efforts to reach FP 2020 goals. And the key theme of expanding contraceptive method choice uh, went through all of these 35 meetings uh, that I'm that I um, I highlight here in a few photographs. So the next slide, please. So. Um, Contraceptive method choice, a key theme at the summit, of course, and at that summit, 30 partners made new or accelerated FP2020 commitments to expand the range of contraceptives available. And as I said in the opening, I believe that these commitments uh, represent a very significant opportunity for all of us to hold those commitment makers accountable and to really realize our goal of having full method choice available to all women in all FP2020 commitment making countries and indeed beyond. And as you can see here, 19 of the FP2020 countries made very specifically worded commitments to expanding method choice um, at the commitments that were announced in London. And I'll just give you a flavor uh, for three of them. CHAD, which was a brand new FP2020 commitment maker at the summit, um, talked about establishing a rights-based approach and training health staff to provide the widest possible range in terms of a method mix under the free, uh, under the banner of free and informed choice. In Nigeria, an original commitment maker from 2012, uh, their commitment spoke about removing regulatory barriers and taking to scale access to new contraceptive methods, including DMPA subcutaneous. Indonesia, another commitment maker uh, from 2012, 
which include in its commitments a very significant a doubling of domestic investment in family planning, including expanding contraceptive method choice, spoke about uh, their desire to improve the contraceptive method mix overall in the country by expanding the number of service delivery points that are capable of providing long-acting reversible contraceptive methods. In addition to these, uh, these countries, a significant number of other commitment makers, including donor organizations, uh, the British government, and indeed uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment, Investment Fund Foundation, made significant expanded investments in the area of uh, contraceptive method choice. And indeed, commitment makers in the private sector, including Pfizer uh, with their commitment around subcutaneous, DMPA, and Shanghai Dawa, uh, with the investments made in the expansion of the availability of their Levo plant implant, really do shape the market and make sure that we have a broad array of contraceptive methods available at the, at the widest possible uh, and the widest possible number of FP2020 countries. This market shaping work for, for, for choice on the market side mirrored, of course, by our desire to make sure that at the client side, there is full choice available. And there was one global good um, that was announced uh, at the summit, um, and that is the innovative partnership for the launch of a public-private collaboration on uh, DMPA SC, an access collaborative led by PATH and JSI under funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children Investment Fund Foundation, and indeed um, about 270 million US dollars in investment between now and 2020, 2022 rather. And those are Ministry of Health-led total market plans for DMPA subcutaneous where um, that collaborative will work with countries to make sure um, these are introduced as part of the broad method mix in a range of FP2020 countries. So great opportunity uh, presented uh, by the summit that we now need to capitalize on as a community, I would argue. Uh, and on to my penultimate slide, please. So uh, we know well these strategies for expanding method choice, uh, I think, and we see them very clearly within FP2020 commitment making countries. Um, within those countries, the commitments are operationalized, of course, within costed implementation plans. And please, I would like uh, all on this call to really go to specific countries' CIPs and really understand what those costed implementation plans are saying about the expansion of, of contraceptive method choice in particular countries. Commitments are operationalized into uh, costed implementation plans, and in turn, the FP2020 focal points in countries, governments, donors, and civil society work together on action plans to make these commitments and costed implementation plans a reality. There's a significant amount of South-South learning that FP2020 uh, engineers at uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the request of particular countries. Uh, a lot of that centers around expanding method mix. For example, we had a great presentation in Malawi last week where uh, 14 other commitment makers got to hear about efforts to expand method choice in that country. We've had very exciting um, South-South exchanges between countries like Indonesia and India recently who are wanting to change um, the, the way that their programs deliver the full range of method choice uh, over the coming years. And these strategies here, in terms of identifying gaps and where there is the possibility for introduction of new contraceptive technologies, this is a key area in which FP2020 is working with partners and commitment-making countries, as well as working on expanding access to existing methods and removing particular barriers. And this is particularly important for specific populations such as adolescents and indeed for young people. And I point everyone to the global consensus statement, which many uh, organizations signed on to a couple of years ago uh, that's on FP2020's website around expanding contraceptive choice for adolescents and young people, including the availability of LARCs uh, to those populations. Thirdly, of course, the expansion of provider base is particularly important here, and there are very significant efforts underway in countries and commitments that relate to task sharing and task shifting to expand uh, the cadres that can uh, deliver particular uh, contraceptive methods. All of this, of course, gets maximized by the robust supply chain work that, again, form the key part of the, uh, the summit in London, and indeed by work on the demand side, uh, which we all know is of crucial importance to maximize 
uh, contraceptive uh, choice. And as Kate pointed out in her previous presentation, the crucial importance of providing uh, provider training and, and counseling training to ensure that the full method choice is set out uh, in, the, in the correct uh, client-centered and rights-based fashion. And I think, you know, we all know that this comes together uh, in a counseling room in a remote part of, of the world where we have a conversation between a provider and a client which operationalizes method choice in an environment of dignity, respect, privacy and confidentiality. And I think many of us have had the privilege with the permission of the client to be in these counseling sessions where we see the manifestation of uh, the full range of method choice and the client making uh, a decision uh, that is, uh, li that is cha uh, life changing for, for herself, for her family, and indeed at the aggregate level, uh, changes trajectories uh, at the country level as well. So on to my final slide, which is that there's a lot to say about this subject and uh, we make ourselves available as an FP2020 Secretariat, myself and the team here in Washington DC, and indeed our focal points around the world to speak further about these opportunities to expand method choice. Please do take some time to look at the commitments that center around expanding method choice on the first URL you can see here. And indeed on the second, the FP2020 core indicators, the A team that I set out earlier on. Uh, and, uh, and it's a nice pivot now because Marissa will obviously uh, introduce uh, Jessica in a second from Avenir Health Track 20 to speak a bit more about the data. So with that, thank you so much for your time this morning, this afternoon, this evening, and uh, back to you, Marissa. Great, thank you so much, Martin. So as Martin said, we will move ahead and hear next from Jessica Williamson from Avenir about measuring method mix and trends in data. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanna thank Marissa and PRB for, uh, for having me here today in the office and for organizing this, um, and my two other co-presenters for, for really well kind of highlighting the importance of this issue, some of the challenges that women face in, in achieving full method choice and some of the things that, that FP2020 is working on um, to expand method choice. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about, about how we're, we're attempting to measure contraceptive method choice um, for FP2020 and, and for Track 20 um, and what the data that we have on method choice and method mix um, can tell us about uh, women's choices and how those might be changing. Um, so first, defining um, and measuring modern contraceptive method mix. So um, for the purposes of, of FP2020 and Track 20, um, our best effort at measuring method choice is using the indicator of modern contraceptive method mix. Now this indicator um, clearly doesn't capture all elements of method choice, um, things around counseling, issues around accessibility, um, but this does reflect what women are using. Um, and so this is, this is one of our efforts to, to capture this area. So I'll be talking about um, this indicator, modern contraceptive method mix. Um, modern contraceptive method mix is defined as the proportion of all family planning, of all modern family planning users who are using each different uh, modern method of contraception. Um, and this data um, is calculated based on nationally represented survey, representative surveys, um, DHS mix PMA. Um, for the purposes of FP2020, um, we attempted to measure this indicator among a population of all women, recognizing that all women should have access to the full range of contraceptive methods. Um, so some limitations, like I mentioned, um, method mix isn't directly measuring method choice, but it is me measuring which methods are in use, which, which methods women are, are accessing. Um, and because this data comes from surveys, we do have a limited ability to track short-term changes um, or shifts in method mix um, over a shorter period of time. Um, so one thing I will be attempting to do later is talk about kind of longer trends that we've seen between surveys. Um, and as Martin noted, and I just wanted to kind of link back with this, um, is that we acknowledge that there's no right method mix, um, but that but the importance of a diverse method mix in indicating that women have the ability to choose from a wide array of methods um, and pick a method that best suits their lifestyle. Um, so Kate set this up really nicely, um, so apologies for repeating it, but that um, I just wanted to highlight um, that while we look at contraceptive method mix at the national level and as an aggregate ac across all women, um, it's obviously a composition of thousands or millions of individual decisions and individual choices that, that women and their partners are making about a method to choose, about, about what method they'd like to use. Um, 
that's based on you know kind of their individual um, characteristics, where they are in their reproductive life cycle, as well as preferences and beliefs about individual methods, um, but are also strongly influenced by larger social and cultural norms um, around family size, around method acceptability, um, and then also issues that are not directly related to their, their preferences and their choice, but that may be limiting their ability to access a full range of methods. Um, so issues around accessibility and availability that Martin mentioned. Um, and so just keeping in mind that when we're looking at this data on the aggregate, um, it's really composed of, you know, of millions of women's individual decisions um, that are informing that. Um, so I wanted to quickly go over how we calculate method mix. So apologies if this is a little repetitive for some of you. Um, but sometimes we want to really clarify the difference between method prevalence and method mix. Um, so in this example, we're looking at um, method prevalence. So we see that out of this population, 50% of women are using a modern method, which are all the women in different colors and non-users in gray. Um, but then in order to calculate method mix, we look out of all of the users of modern methods, what proportion of those users are using each of the different um, modern contraceptive methods. Um, so while 50% of women are using a modern method, of those 50%, 30% are using implants, 10% female sterilization, 40% injectables, and 20% other modern methods. Um, and this is important in, in, in when, we're, when we're looking and comparing between countries. And so um, in this example, we're looking at data from the DHS, from Kenya and Senegal. Um, and so based on the method mix data between these two countries, um, both countries have similar proportions of users who are utilizing implants as their, their um, modern method of contraception. Um, and in Senegal, we have a much larger proportion of women choosing to use pills. Um, so this is when we're looking at the method mix. Um, when we shift to look at method prevalence, which tells us what proportion of all women are using modern methods, uh, we see a very different picture. So in the context of Kenya, about three times more women, um, more, more, uh, three, three times more of the population are using implants um, as compared to Senegal. Um, and also we see a higher proportion of women using pills, um, but partly this is because of the differential level of use between Kenya um, and Senegal. So just to highlight that um, both of these indicators and all of this information can be very useful, but tell us different things and indicate different things about uh, method choice and method use, um, and so keeping these differences in mind when looking at this data. So in some parts of the presentation, I'll talk about method mix, and in other parts, I'll talk about method prevalence. Um, so I just wanted to set this up in advance. Um, so next, I wanted to look at the, the data that we have on modern contraceptive mix, method mix um, across FP2020 countries. Um, so this is a little overwhelming, um, but this is the modern contraceptive mix data for all 69 FP2020 countries plus South Africa. Um, and so what you see here is a really diverse mix. So variation across many countries. Um, but one piece that I wanted to point out um, and link back to what Kate had said earlier um, is that we see a substantial number of countries where injectables, which are in the darker purple color, make up a large proportion of, of the contraceptive method mix. So we do see that in many countries, injectables are, um, are the most common method in use, um, with some notable distinctions, some notable countries in here like Nepal, uh, Pakistan, India, um, where some of these longer acting methods are making up a much larger proportion of use, and then other countries where this um, yellow bar, which, is, which represents condoms, um, are making up a much larger portion. So I'll, I'll leave this here that everyone can look at it later in the slides that get sent out because um, a lot of really interesting information in here. Um, but just to highlight that contraceptive method mix is a very complicated and um, kind of dense indicator, but there's a lot of information that can be pulled from here. It's a very rich um, indicator. Um, so one element, um, taking all of that data and, and attempting to condense it into, into what else we can learn about uh, contraceptive method choice, um, is looking at the modern methods in use. And here we've defined um, methods in use as methods that make up at least 5% of modern method use. Um, and so we see a, a large distribution with most countries um, in the FP2020 um, initiative having four methods in use. So that's about 24% or 20, 24 of the countries. Um, so some outliers are, there's three countries that have six, which was the, the largest uh, number of methods in use that we identified, which are Bhutan, Cambodia and Kenya. 
Um, and then two countries, Uzbekistan and DPR Korea, which only have one method in use, and that's IUDs. And in both of these countries, as you'll see, I think in the next slide, um, IUDs make up a massive proportion of their, of their contraceptive method mix. So another interesting element to pull out from this, and I highlighted this previously, um, is looking at what's the most common method in use among these countries. And so we look at which method makes up the largest proportion of the contraceptive method mix. Um, so out of the FP2020 countries, in, in 28 of those countries, injectables are the most common method in use. Um, but we do see some substantial variation by country. So several countries, um, in several countries, female sterilization is the most common method in use. So we see that in, um, in South Asia and also in Latin America. Um, LAM is the most popular method in just one country um, and implants in, in one country, but, um, but largely what we see is injectables, um, oral contraceptive pills as being the most commonly, uh, most commonly uh, the most common method in use. Um, so one other element I wanted to highlight based on this data uh, is looking at contraceptive method skew. And this occurs when one method uh, really dominates the method mix. So makes up, uh, we defined it as 60% or more of the modern contraceptive method mix. Um, so you'll see the two examples I highlighted earlier, um, Korea and Uzbekistan, where IUDs are making up more than 80% of modern use. Um, and this information, um, I wanted to highlight this because I think that this addresses some of the issues around choice. So method skew can be indicative of individual women's preferences um, or norms around a method, but when we see kind of this dramatic skew, um, it may also be driven by barriers to women accessing other methods. Um, so kind of elements of the healthcare system, issues around stockouts and method availability, that may limit women's ability to access other types of contraceptive methods. Um, and so then the final piece I wanted to talk about um, is looking at trends in modern contraceptive method mix and prevalence. Um, and really the attempt here was to look at um, changes since the initiation of the FP2020 initiative. So this is an analysis of um, method, method prevalence and mixed data for 25 countries that had a recent survey, um, so 2014 or later, and a prior survey of the same type that was conducted before the FP2020 initiative began. So really trying to look at comparable data before and after um, the initiation of FP2020. Um, so again, sorry for kind of overwhelming multicolored slides. It's a lot of information. Um, but what we're looking at here are regional changes in method prevalence. And so these are the average annual percentage point change in method prevalence. So for each year, um, on average, how many percentage points were added or subtracted from method prevalence um, by each method. Um, so if you look at the at the far category, which shows the total, um, on average, we see that the fastest growth was seen in among implants and injectable prevalence. And you see this especially in East and Southern Africa um, and Western Africa, where, um, where implant prevalence grew substantially over the, um, on, on average. Um, slow growth was seen in um, pills and male condoms. And then on the aggregate, we saw slight declines in female sterilization and IUD prevalence. Um, so this is looking across all of the countries included in this analysis. So we see kind of the largest growth, the fastest growth occurring in Lesotho with the slowest growth um, occurring in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and what those growths are, what that, that growth is composed of in terms of changes in, in method prevalence. Um, and of note, of, across most of these countries, so 17 of the 25 saw substantial growth in implants and injectables between the last two surveys. And that's kind of a common theme in this change analysis. So because we talked about methods in use previously, I wanted to link back with that, looking um, at the cha at changes in the number of methods in use between um, pre uh, FC 2020 and um, post. So um, among the 25 countries, nine saw increases in the number of modern methods in use, uh, while only three saw declines. The largest increase was seen in Sao Tome, where three methods, injectables, IUDs, and condoms, um, expanded as proportion of, uh, proportions of the method mix to make up at least 5%. Um, and several, and two of the countries that we see that have six methods in use, so Kenya and Cambodia, those are more recent developments um, since 2014 or since the, their most recent survey. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to look at, link back to that, that, that indicator looking at most common method in use. Um, and between these two um, timeframes, between the most recent survey and the previous survey, 
um, there wasn't a substantial change in the most common method in use. So for most countries, that most common method remained and was consistent. But we did see substantial movement in the second most common method in use. Um, and you'll see a lot of that light green color. Um, so for many countries prior to 2012, um, implants were not a substantial portion of their method mix or were not making up um, a substantial proportion of the use. Uh, but post-2014, in many of these countries, we saw a shift where implants are kind of moving up as a more, as a larger proportion of, um, of a number of countries' method mix. Um, and we also see this with um, injectables. Um, and I think that should be it. So yeah, so thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. So we have a bit of time left for questions and discussion from our audience. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and type that into the questions panel of your GoToWebinar control panel to submit that. And apologies in advance if we aren't able to get to every question that comes in. Um, a few questions have come in so far. And first to Martin and then to Kate. Um, for Martin, as you look at the opportunities to expand contraceptive method choice, what are the priority one to two investments that you think policymakers should be making to expand method choice? And then for Kate, on the same lines, looking at youth in particular, what do you see as the priority policy investment that's needed to expand method choice for youth? So Martin, please go ahead. So thanks very much. And indeed, my, my priority number one was going to be around uh, um, around services for uh, for young people and for adolescents. And uh, as we acknowledged at the summit in 2017, and this was reflected uh, in the commitments that were made, uh, we're looking at uh, at a group who traditionally been perhaps underserved uh, in terms of. Uh, availability of contraceptive uh, information and services. And so um, in working with countries, I think our number one priority has to be to realize full method choice available for, for young people and for adolescents and to make sure that that's accompanied uh, with the relevant uh, removal of, um, of barriers and so forth that currently hold back um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the important uh, availability of services to this critical uh, Critical group, um, not only for the uh, for the achievement of FP 2020 goals, but more importantly uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the future. Uh, secondly, I would say um, to make sure that um, that we have uh, a number of uh, of market shaping initiatives around uh, new uh, injectables and new implants, and to ensure that we move quickly uh, in partnership with countries to to uh, to um, prioritize uh, the registration of those products and their incorporation into both the public and private sector. Uh, several countries made specific reference to their desire to uh, improve the availability of, of long-acting reversible contraceptives. Indonesia was an example I highlighted earlier. Several countries um, acknowledged their desire to be looking at DMPA subcutaneous uh, alongside other um, other methods, um, and of course, there are great possibilities in terms of self-injection trials that are going on with the MPASC in places uh, like Malawi, uh, Uganda, and Burkina Faso at the moment. So, I would say young people number one, and to ensure that um, we link the the exciting developments happening at the market level with the availability of those uh, products uh, in the swiftest possible fashion if governments desire um, at the country level, so the client, uh, the client benefits. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Martin. And Kate, for you, following up on the issue of priority investments for adolescents. Um, I completely agree with Martin, and I think he said it all. I'm just going to highlight two points. One is the availability of LARCs. And the second point, which goes to emphasize the first point, it's generally just this um, counseling and provider bias or prejudice. And it's not just the providers, it's the community. So basically, if, if there is a way <laughs> that policies could ensure that young people are not put aside or, you know, are not, don't, don't have to 
overcome barriers, don't have to convince an adult or convince a provider that they need something um, or don't have to get consent. So that aspect of providing community bias and the second being the focus on LARCs, making them available, but also making them accessible. Thank you, hope that answers that. Great, thanks so much, Kate. Um, a few questions have come in for Jessica looking at the data. And so a number of people have questions about sources of data. What are the best sources of data to identify what methods are realistically available in countries and also what methods people are using? Um, and looking globally, not just at developing countries, but are there good sources of data for developed countries, including the US? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. So I think, um, so the first piece was about kind of what are sources of, of data around what methods are available. Um, and so, so typically for, for our purposes, we're looking at nationally representative surveys. Um, so, you know, like I said, DHS, uh, MIX, PMA 2020, and, and national surveys. Um, so there are other opportunities to look in countries um, HMIS or service statistics data to understand what methods are in use. So again, kind of facing that limitation of, of methods that are being used as opposed to methods that are available. Um, but LMIS data um, looking at um, contraceptive um, commodities can also indicate what methods are, are physically available or are in facilities. Um, and then the, the NCIFP and the FPE um, data sets, which should be available on the TRAC-20 website, do look at, um, at method availability. Um, and those are, are surveys that are conducted among key informants in country, um, asking about the availability of methods um, and asking them to rate kind of the availability of different methods. So that would be method specific. Um, so yeah, that data is available on the TRAC-20 website. Um, and then in the context of developed countries, um, I, you know, I'm not quite as, as well versed in terms of uh, where that data would come from. Um, I know uh, National Survey of Family Growth um, in the U.S. would probably have that data um, so comparable to what would be available in the DHS, but um, yeah, my experience is mostly limited to the to developing countries and looking at the FP2020 countries. Great, thanks so much. Um, lots of questions coming in. Uh, another question for both Martin and Kate. Um, could you comment on the particular attributes that you think would be valuable in new contraceptives um, as we look at new contraceptive technologies or just in expanding access? Are there particular attributes that you think would be valuable as we expand method mix? Um, Martin, why don't you go ahead first? Sure, well, um, the uh Expanding the range of, uh, of contraceptives for men uh, is uh, is of crucial uh, crucial importance, of course. And I know that there are uh, there are trials underway at the moment um, uh, for for new uh, for new methods uh, for men that are that are very exciting. I think the um, you know taking taking services closer to the client uh, overall is um, has been a real feature uh, of the last few years in family planning. Uh, we talked about the importance of community-based distribution, and now we have the possibility of, uh, of self-injection, um, which I mentioned earlier on with regard to uh, one method, the MPA uh, subcutaneous. And I think, you know, in all of this, the needs of women and, 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 uh, and, and girls and families at the center, fundamental to FP2020, but putting, putting choice in the hands of the women and moving uh, decision-making and service delivery closer to the doorstep. Um, uh, is uh, is of crucial importance. So, of course, I'm saying all of this <clears throat> uh, with the caveats that the method has to be properly uh, safe and in the hands of the correct uh, the correct cadre of, of provider. But um, but fundamental attribute of being um, you know being able to uh, to be uh, on the supply chain in a in a um, without a cold chain necessary. Uh, being able to get to remote parts of uh, of, of the FP2020 world and being as close as possible to the doorstep of the client in terms of um in terms of the uh, the method then uh, being administered thanks and kate anything to add there um so when you just asked the question the first thing that came to mind is methods that men can use and boys can use so i agree totally um with martin's first point the second thing i would say in my opinion it would be a dream come true if there were long-acting reversible contraceptives 
that could be could be self administered, and you could take out your soul whenever you wanted to. Because it's when I was practicing in Cameroon, one of the most disheartening things is people having to go get methods, having to convince people, refer them. They don't go. They don't have money to get it. And we all know that for young people, they can very easily buy their contraceptives from pharmacies. So if it's something that could be sovereignty said, but then it's long term, that will be a dream come true. And then taking out the contraceptives when they actually would like to conceive um, and having to go to a doctor for that again. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Kate. On that subject of ending use of a family planning method, we have a question about discontinuation. So for Jessica, in calculating additional users in SP 2020, how is discontinuation accounted for or is it accounted for? Um, and in regards to the impact of family planning programs, you know, what are sort of the sources of data that you use to look at that? Okay. Um, so for the first question, so we do not directly account for discontinuation in the calculation for additional users, um, but we do account for it in as much as it's captured in the contraceptive prevalence of a given country. Um, so additional users is calculated based on population um, and contraceptive prevalence at two separate points in time, and it would be the difference in the number of users calculated from that calculation. Um, SP 2020 has added, as Martin said, um, a discontinuation indicator to, to try and look at this on a more regular basis um, and provide more, more information about that. Um, and then in terms of the, um, the way that we're calculating impacts, um, so the, the impact indicators are calculated um, using a number of factors that were agreed upon by a working group um, part of the SB 2020 initiative. Um, so Michelle Weinberger um, would be a better person to answer this question, um, but um, those are agreed upon and they're, uh, they're visible in our calculation tools that we have available on, our, on the Track 20 website. So the assumptions that are going into those calculations are accessible. Um, so yeah, great. Thanks so much. And just, uh, if I can just add to that, of course, um, Please. Yeah, ex explanation of these um, uh, these measurement uh, um, techniques um, on the on the Family Planning 2020.org um, measurement hub um, uh, slash measurement dash hub slash additional dash users, and and I think Jessica, all of this is is mirrored in terms of availability on on the Avenir Track 20 website as well. Yeah. Oh, the only other thing, and, and maybe Martin, I'm sure this is part of that site, but there was recently a webinar on additional users and on how that indicator is calculated and how it's intended to be interpreted. Um, so that should also be on the FP2020 um, measurement hub, I there's, assume. There's a recording of that webinar indeed. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So we are coming up towards the end of our hour. I want to thank everybody for their time and participation and for good questions. There were a number of interesting questions that we couldn't get to, some looking at counseling um, and some questions looking further at this question of method mix versus method choice and how do we sort out the distinction between those two. So I do want to direct your attention to a recent policy brief that we produced here at PRB with a number of inputs from the colleagues on the webinar today. Um, that looks at method choice and includes a number of resources and discussion about the counseling issues to overcome myths and misconceptions. Um, examples of how policymakers and program implementers can use that family planning effort index data that Jessica mentioned and use that in coordination with their method mix data to identify areas for priority investments. So there's a lot more resources there. I'd also like to confirm that we, we have been recording this webinar, and so all of those of you who registered, you'll get a follow-up email from us in a few days with a link to this recording, as well as a few more resources that may be valuable to you as you consider to, as you continue to consider contraceptive method choice and how we can work as a collective community to expand that. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. All the best.